Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about, like everyone else, is Russia, Ukraine, and by extension, the world. Vladimir Putin was wrong. What Russia has done to Ukraine violates international law, and it violates basic fundamental moral principles. Good people around the world are not afraid to stand up in protest of Putin's actions. About that, there is unity across Europe. Putin forced a very difficult situation, and only Iran and China and Belarus seem to side with Russia. And that is saying a lot. Vladimir Putin has pushed us all towards a new world. A new world comes with a new set of rules. Western-leaning governments and international organizations are trying to determine what they can do to help protect Ukrainians from the Russians. Not what they can say, but what they can do. Mouthing the words, Putin is wrong, and let's support Zelensky and his people defend against the aggression of Russia is easy. The difficulty is translating those expressions into actions, actions that keep Ukraine safe. The United Nations, NATO, even the United States, what magic can they work in the face of this irrational, life-threatening, discordant behavior? Putting boots on the ground or sending planes up in the air will only escalate the situation, not just there, but anywhere. That should be obvious. Direct fighting warfare between Russia and either the United States or NATO would almost certainly trigger a world war. Sure, there's sanctions, sanctions and even harsher sanctions, the only sensible response is to isolate Russia even more than the isolation Putin's domain now lives under. That means expelling Russian participants in international sports and cultural activities. It means removing professionals from science-based organizations, activities, and conferences. It means expelling Russian diplomats. It does not just mean shutting Russia's commercial travel out of airspace. It also means closing uh, ports to Russia. To even the playing field, Ukraine needs weapons, more and more weapons. Ukraine needs weapons that will continue to need those weapons even afterwards. This is a lesson that should have been learned from the debacle of Afghanistan. Russia should have paid better attention in Afghanistan. Once the United States provided shoulder-mounted missiles like stringers and javelins to the Mujahideen, the game changed dramatically. Suddenly Russia discovered that people who were living in caves were shooting down Russian MiGs. These are simple point and shoot and throw away weapons. It takes little to no training to learn to engage in warfare with these weapons. An untrained but highly motivated person can destroy a world-class tank or fighter jet by simply turning one on, pointing and pulling its trigger. These weapons are just as ideal for Ukrainians fighting Russians in 2022 as they were for Afghanis fighting the Russians in the 1980s. Germany held uh, a principle. For decades, Germany would not deliver weapons into an area of conflict. Their point was not to fuel the conflict, but to provide defensive tools in advance, to prevent the conflict, not to further the fighting. The Germans believed that providing weapons uh, during the fighting would lengthen it, and more people would die, innocent people would die. Better to end the conflict faster than to provide weapons during the battle. In 2022, though, Germany broke with their long-standing tradition and promised a thousand shoulder-mounted weapons to Ukraine. Germany adjusted their tradition and concluded that the weapons would make a difference. Germany knows firsthand about conflicts caused by men with outsized egos and a penchant for destruction. Germany knows about dictators, and Vladimir Putin is a dictator. While there are some elements of democracy within Russia, Putin is definitely a dictatorial, authoritarian leader. Russia today might be less of a dictatorship than it was under Stalin, but Putin's Russia is definitely run by a dictator. Not too long ago, I wrote a book called Thugs. I focused on some of the most evil leaders in the world throughout history, and it offered me tremendous insight into authoritarian leaders. These leaders share essential character traits that give us insight into Putin. Dictators are always right, all of them, all the time. They hate to be wrong and surround themselves with people who only tell them that they are correct. 
When something goes wrong, the leaders were not wrong. Their advisors were wrong. The advisors pay the price. Dictators, even the most benevolent dictators, are vastly removed from reality, from the everyday life of the people. They have no understanding of real issues that people confront daily. Dictators are greedy and they want more. No matter how much they have, they push for more than and more and more and more. They are never satisfied. This is always, there's always something somewhere that they want. Dictators believe that they speak the truth all the time. They do not think that they are lying. The truth is whatever they say, it is. They say whatever they need to say to get what they want. There is no honor and there's no such thing as a treaty or a lasting agreement. Everything is of the moment. And when a better or different opportunity is presented, the previous agreement is thrown out the window for a new truth. The world is now a different place, but it's not better. Putin is neither the only nor the final dictator any of us will encounter in our lifetimes. The best we can do is to pre-plan strategies to diffuse their aggression and to preserve the good in our lives and in our world. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from the Jerusalem Post. It was published on February 26, 2022, and was written by Stephen Flato. Flato is a lawyer who lives in New Jersey. His daughter, Eliza, was murdered in 1995 by Palestinian terrorists sponsored by Iran. The column is entitled, Ukraine Crisis Shows Israel the International Community Won't Rescue You. Subtitled, Opinion. Even though Israel's presence in Judea and Samaria is fully supported by history and international law, and Russia illegally occupies large parts of Ukraine, accusations against Israel will continue. Plato asks and answers a critical question that is on the minds of everyone who loves Israel and everyone who is concerned about Israel's safety. Given the powerlessness of the Western world during the Russian attack and invasion of Ukraine, what can the Western world do other than talk to help Israel, if ever, there was a need, especially an immediate need. Flato gives four reasons, four lessons for why Israel is all alone. And this is how he begins. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has only just begun, yet the lessons for Israel are already obvious and they're not very encouraging. Lesson number one, the international community will not rescue you. If there was a situation in which the international community would be totally justified to come to the armed defense of a beleaguered ally, this is it. Ukraine is the innocent victim of Russian aggression. Ukraine is a democracy. Russia is a de facto totalitarian. Ukraine's location makes it strategically vital to the West, yet none of that matters. Not a single country is willing to take up arms to defend Ukraine against the Russian assault. Every one of the reasons cited above and many more would apply if Israel was again invaded by its Arab neighbors. And not in a single country, including Israel's closest allies, would pick up a gun if faced with annihilation. Flato continues by listing ways in which the United States has helped Israel in times of need. It's not what you think. You'll be shocked. Flato writes, when Arab armies invaded newborn Jewish state in 1948, the Truman administration declared an arms embargo and refused to give Israel a single bullet. When Arab armies surrounded Israel in 1967 and prepared to attack, the Johnson administration refused to lift a finger. When Arab armies prepared to invade Israel in 1973, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger pressured Israelis not to strike first and then withheld weapons for 10 days in order to prevent Israel from achieving a decisive victory. When Israel defended itself against mass rocket attacks by Hezbollah in 2006 and by Hamas in 2008, 2014, 2021, the U.S. pressured the Israelis to end their operations prematurely, thus granting de facto victories to the terrorists. Flato now comes to reasons two, three, and four on why Israel will stand alone. Lesson two, he says, hypocrisy will never end. Regardless of Russia's own behavior, Russia and its allies will continue to falsely accuse Israel of illegally occupying Arab territory. Lesson number three, appeasers will look for ways to appease. World leaders who see appeasement as the easy way out will continue to look for ways to appease dictators rather than confront them. 
And lesson number four, it matters who your neighbors are. Throughout history, dictators have constantly assaulted their neighbors. Sometimes they have been motivated by religion or nationalism. Sometimes they have wanted to distract their own population from domestic problems. Usually some combination of those motives has been involved. Whatever their motives, the indisputable fact is that authoritarian regimes often turn aggressive. For its conclusion, Flato writes that this is not new for Israel, but it is a reminder, a wake-up call. This is what he writes. Thus, the Ukraine crisis is a reminder to Israel that this is what happens when you have a hostile fascist dictatorship next door. And when hostile Palestine and its Arab allies prepare to attack, nobody will come to Israel's rescue. Believe me when I tell you that Israel's leaders know this message to be true, but a reminder is always useful. Next up is a column by Lazer Berman that was written on February 27, 2022, and was published in the Times of Israel. The piece is entitled, Why a Clear Moral Anti-Russian Stance from Israel Might Not Be Good for Anyone. Subtitled, Foreign Minister Lapid reportedly wants Israel to side with Ukraine as Prime Minister Bennett avoids directly condemning Moscow. Berman is asking what the best approach to Russia is for Israel. This is very complicated for Israel and the region itself. This is how Berman actually begins. Even before Russian troops rolled into Ukraine from three directions last week, Israel was in an awkward diplomatic situation. It's no secret that the United States is far away Jerusalem's closest ally. Israel also enjoys deep and varied ties with individual European states and in many regards with European Union as an institution. Israel's relationship with Ukraine is robust as well. Tens of thousands of Ukrainian IT professionals work for Israeli companies. And Ukraine is one of Israel's main suppliers of wheat, eggs, and other staples. Ukraine would also like nothing more than for Israel to sell its advanced weapon systems. As was hinted, it would recognize Jerusalem as Israeli capital if the defense relationship were enhanced. But Israel also has a very robust relationship, by the way, with Russia, especially as it relates to Syria and Syrian airspace and Israel's need to apply and to uh, fly over Syria when striking enemies plotting against the Jewish state. And Berman writes this. At the same time, Israeli leaders know that they must maintain strategic ties with Russia. Israel is unique among Western countries in that it does not see Moscow as an adversary and Russia does not feel threatened by Israel. Though Israel proved itself willing to kill Soviet soldiers and pilots during the Cold War, today the situation is quite different. Since September 2015, Russia has maintained an active military presence over Israel's northern border in Syria to support the Bashar Assad regime. Here's the predicament in Israel. On the one hand, Foreign Minister Yair Lapid says that Israel should condemn the invasion. On the other hand, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett thinks that they should stay neutral. Berman explains why it is best for everyone that Israel remain neutral. He concludes by writing, it might not even be especially advantageous to Ukraine if Israel alienates Russia. If Putin does want a mediator at some point, and it may well be that there is no end game other than negotiations. Israel is one of a few options that both sides would be comfortable with. This is correct, by the way. However, I need to add that it is essential to condemn that which was wrong. Russia knows that Israel has a relationship with both Ukraine and with Russia. All parties will respect Israel more if she's honest and straightforward. One can condemn and still be trusted by both sides. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to show you eight cartoons and memes today. The first is a school child on career day in school. The child is presenting his career choice to the teacher and the class and says, I want to be a politician so that I don't have to wear a mask. Cartoons like this are so very funny and so biting. There are many hypocrites in politics. Politicians who say one thing and then do another. Next up is a cartoon that depicts Stalin and Putin looking at a map. Stalin is pointing to Ukraine. 
The poignant reality is that Putin is reliving, reproducing Stalin's land grabs. Third, there's a wonderful play on inflation and graffiti messaging. The graffiti on the bagel shop reads, overpriced and under cream cheesed. In other words, the costs are going up and the product is getting smaller, even the amount of cream cheese on the bagel. There are two passers-by. One says to the other, this is no ordinary act of vandalism. It's obviously a schmear campaign. But a dump. <laughs> Fourth up is a meme. It's simply a funny line. It's about what happens when you get to a certain age. And nowadays, even more than before because of COVID, you end up visiting cemeteries. This meme reads, felt uncomfortable driving into the cemetery. The GPS blurted out, you have reached your final destination. This next meme is also just simply funny. It reads, joke of the day bumper sticker on a senior's car. I'm speeding because I have to get there before I forget where I am going. This next meme makes fun of inflation. It reads, I usually don't talk about the expensive trips I take, but I just got back from the grocery store. That's funny. It doesn't matter who you voted for. That's funny. The last meme is about solving problems and how people solve their own problems and how they find ways of finding solutions to their problems. This meme reads, it turns out that the answer to my problems was not at the bottom of this pint of ice cream. But the important thing is that I tried. I love that one. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. This will give you a sense of who Vladimir Putin is. Uh, what he likes as a leader, the idea of what he thinks of the United States, especially of what Russian President Vladimir Putin thinks of President Joe Biden. Putin did not watch, he did not even listen to Joe Biden's speech announcing sanctions against Russia and against Russian forces after they marched into the cities that Putin claims to be Russian. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov confirmed that information he said, not explained, plain out said that Putin was in a meeting. The defiant Vladimir Putin was broadcast all over Russia. This diss was heard around the world. Not even listening to the President of the United States was a blatant act of arrogance. The President of Russia does not give a hoot what the President of the United States has to say. And we saw that from the very beginning of this conflict. When Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Bennett offered humanitarian aid to Ukraine, and Zelensky suggested that Bennett serve as a mediator between his country and Russia. Israel is probably the only country in the world that is trusted by both Russia and Ukraine. The Prime Minister's office neither confirmed nor denied reports that Zelensky made the request. Their statement read, Prime Minister Bennett reiterated his hope for a speedy end to the fighting and said that he stands by the people of Ukraine in these difficult days. Anonymous is an international hacking collective, and Anonymous made it clear to Putin that they are attacking Russia, that they want him out of Ukraine, and that they want him to resign. Anonymous posted their demands on Twitter and on YouTube and on various other social media. They have successfully attacked and knocked out six government websites, including the Ministry of Defense and the Kremlin. They have made it very difficult for Russia to get their message out. And they've also taken down the website and the transmission of RTV, which is official Russian English language TV stations. Anonymous tweeted that they will work to keep these sites down and to fight to keep Ukrainian sites and the internet open in Ukraine according to their tweet, and this is a quote from Anonymous. Anonymous has ongoing operations to keep Russian government websites offline and to push information to the Russian people so that they can be free of Putin's state censorship machine. We also have ongoing operations to keep the Ukrainian people online as best we can, unquote. Elon Musk has also shown his support for Ukraine. He has moved satellites to focus on Ukraine and to make certain that their internet and communications are accessible. Must promise more satellite coverage for Ukraine in the coming days. When Iranian President Ibrahim 
Rezi spoke to Vladimir Putin. He pledged support for Russia. Iran also made it illegal for citizens of Iran to criticize Russia. And yet, some brave Iranians went out to protest Russia's action, and many more took to social media to slam Putin and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Iranians are defying their leadership, and they are protesting the Russian action. One very large protest took place in Tehran, the Iranian capital. The protesters were celebrated and supported by Twitters from around the world, who reiterated the Iranian message that Putin and the leadership are linked. Iranian leadership is linked with Putin. Russia and Putin have very few supporters. In fact, Iranian leadership and the Chinese leadership are probably the only other supporters. Mansour Abbas is the head of Ra'am, the United Arab List Party, which recently sits and sits in the Israeli government. Abbas met with a delegation from the Conference of Major American Jewish Organizations, which recently held their conference in Jerusalem. He met the delegation in the Knesset. Abbas is a smart politician. Since joining Bennett's government, Mansour Abbas has met with quite a few Jewish groups and Jewish leaders. He explained his mission this way. We Arabs in Israel are the bridge that can create hope for the two peoples living together in the Holy Land. Based on the vision of Jews and Arabs living together in security, peace, and mutual respect, this can bring light to the entire world. Abbas is aware that American Jews are very concerned about Jewish t Arab tensions. His perception is that there is tension. His meetings will allow for direct funding from American Jews to Arab communities. This is a win-win in many ways. Arabs in Israel will win by getting much-needed money from American Jews. American Jews win by learning about the complexity of the integrating uh, Arabs into Israeli society. And Israel will win because American Jews recognize that Arabs of Israel are full members and full citizens of Israeli society. Iran has returned 820,000 out of a million anti-COVID shots that were donated by Poland to help Iran. The shots that were returned are from the United States and Britain. They were produced by AstraZeneca. Iranian health spokesperson Mohammad Hashimi said, but when the vaccines arrived in Iran, we found out that 820,000 doses of them, which were imported from Poland, were from the United States. And then he added, after coordination with the Polish ambassador to Iran, it was decided that the vaccines would be returned. As far back as 2020, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who has final say on all state matters, rejected any possibility of American or British vaccines entering the country. He called them forbidden. 135,000 Iranians have died from COVID. Iran has the highest death rate from COVID in the Middle East. 90% of Iranians today, Iranian adults over 18, have had two shots. Only 37% have received a third shot. Iran has been relying on Sinopharm, the state-backed Chinese anti-COVID vaccine, but also offers Iranian citizens a smorgasbord of other shots to choose from, including the Russian Sputnik V, Indian Bharat Covaxin, and its own Iranian vaccine called Cov Iran, Barakat, a shot. British-Swedish-owned AstraZeneca makes up most of Iran's inoculations. But they still need more. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. We have been dealing a lot with serious issues these past few weeks. And the cartoons and the memes help break the seriousness and provide humor. That's the idea. That is their intention, their job. That's why I put them in in the first place. Not just to add insight, of course, which is also true, but insight with humor. In one of today's cartoons, I spoke about a bagel joint and the costs going up. Did you ever wonder about the origin of the bagel? The bagel is ubiquitously Jewish. It is actually Eastern European Jewish. I remember the first time I saw Jews from the Arab lands, AKA Mizrahi or Sephardic Jews, who were given bagels to eat for the first time. It was a weird experience for them, different from anything they had ever tasted and certainly not their traditional food. 
Today, bagels are all over Israel, almost all over the world. Basically, a bagel is boiled and then baked. It is a round ring of dough with a crusty outside and a very chewy inside. Ironically, the first mention of such a bread is in an Arabic cookbook from the 13th century, from the 1200s, and the bread is called ka'ak, which also means circle. We find it as part of the food in the royal family of Poland in 1394, and there it's known as abawasnik. It was a braided ring. In the 17th century, actually in 1610, we see it in Krakow as a Jewish food that was given to Jewish women after childbirth. Leo Rostin, in his quintessential book, The Joys of Yiddish, asserts that the word comes from the medieval German bagel, which means ring or bracelet. Now the biali. Well, the biali is very different. Why? Biali is a very different term, a very different bread. The biali style, we know, came from Bialystok, in what is today northeastern Poland. Biali is shortened form of Bialystok. The actual name of the bread is Bialystok a pretzel. A pretzel is a flatbread, which means a flatbread from Bialystok. Today we call it biali. Simple as that. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Michael Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.